Check, check. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out today. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce um, the next talk in the uh, TSVP uh, Visiting Scholars Program. Uh, this is uh, Professor Christophe Claramunt from um, the University of uh, I'm sorry, my pr French pronunciation is uh, awful, so don't cringe. Art et Métier, Institute of Technology in France. Um, I have a bit of a truncated CV here. He is where he is a uh, professor of computer science. Um, he also works at the uh, Naval uh, Academy Research Institute and is also uh, the uh, deputy director of the IS Blue Interdisciplinary Graduate School for the Blue Planet, which um, whose goal is uh, to push back the frontiers in marine science, marine technology, and ocean innovation. So this seems like a big interdisciplinary uh, uh, group of uh, marine scientists. Uh, he's previously uh, worked as a senior lecturer in computing at the Nottingham Trent University, and as a senior uh, scientist in geographic information sciences at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Uh, his research uh, is very multidisciplinary, but uh, tends to focus on um, thinking about geographic questions uh, quantitatively in um, using very big data to do so. So um, maybe this, maybe some of what we're going to learn today uh, could be most aptly characterized uh, as sort of like a macro sociology, um, highly quantitative approaches to understanding human movements using things like uh, you know cell phone tracking. Um, particle tracking, things like that. Um, and he also has interests in, uh, in entropy and trying to figure out uh, new ways to describe um, entropy by taking space and time into account as well. So we've been chatting a lot about um, how we might use uh, some of his uh, approaches to characterize uh, biodiversity, say, in a spatial or temporal context. Uh, so with that, today he'll be uh, talking about people, environments, and sensors, cyber opportunities for exploring human mobilities. So uh, Christoph, please uh, take it away. And let's all give him a quick round of applause. Well, good afternoon to everyone. And thanks, Dave, for your nice introduction, but uh, somehow and really put my presentation in, in perspective. Uh, before starting, uh, I would like to say a few words and let's say about the TSVP program and, and really Jonas and Lynn are making a, a great job in organizing uh, all TSVP uh, participants and, and members. So I should be grateful to, to both of them for really uh, facilitating my uh, stay here and, and really uh, the TSVP OIST are great environment and also thanks to Nick to setting up this great program and I hope more colleagues uh, will come in, in the next uh, few, few years. So as Dave mentioned, the, the talk today will not be about the maritime environment, but I will make uh, next month two specific lectures for, for the students one on uh, maritime science and another one uh, quite related to the subject I will be introducing today. So the, the seminar today uh, will be about uh, people, the environment, uh, human sensors, and the way novel technologies nowadays provide novel opportunities for exploring, understanding human mobilities is a kind of pluridisciplinary research area. As Dave mentioned, I am a computer scientist involved in geographical information system now for, for years, but most of the work I have been involved in over the past years, and some of those works will be presented today, have been developing a relation, close relationship with geographers, with transportation planners, and with a strong connection to practical and, and real application. What is the specific uh, subject uh, today? Uh, Mobility is movement, people movements are not new, but over the, the past uh, centuries, of course, people are, have been more and more moving at different scales in space and time. And this is obviously uh, also related to, to many dimensions. One of them is freedom, 
emancipation and many opportunities to travel in space and time. And, and this will offer uh, many opportunities. I will introduce them uh, in a few minutes to, to understand the kind of pattern that happen in space and time, the way people move and behave at different scale, at the urban scale, at the regional scale, and these for, for many application purposes. From a modeling point of view, the idea will be to, to, to model patterns at the individual, at the uh, individual, at the, uh, let's say, uh, macro level, to try us as computer scientists to develop modeling framework to understand how people behave, how people act in space and time at the very local level, uh, at the macro level, in order to understand these patterns. And really the idea will be, and I will browse about some of the research I've been involved in, and also before I, I came out, over the past, uh, let's say, 50 years, and the way uh, people, uh, especially from geographical and environmental studies, have been dealing with the question, how can we model urban migration patterns? How can we uh, model at the very local scale to the very uh, macro uh, from urban to regional national scales? And I will sort of browse through the, what we call the, the early days, uh, let's say in the, in the 60s, where the transportation and geographical communities were developing massive surveys to, to understand how people move at the urban, at the regional scale. Then uh, a new uh, technology and software dimension uh, did appear in the 80s, what we call the geographical information system impact to then, and this will be the, the last part of my talk, how the, the cyberspace nowadays will offer novel opportunities, very much different from the way we were modeling this uh, movement migration patterns in the early 60s and 80s. So the different dimensions uh, I will be uh, today discussing will be first of all uh, the geographical dimension where data will be made of uh, let's say geographical uh, data not only geographical data at different uh, scales but also integration of geographical data with semantic data and this is the way uh, in the 80s we were developing geographical information system to understand this mobility pattern the second dimension which is coming up is the one of the sensor-based, uh, let's say, uh, data dimension, where we do have more and more human and physical sensors that provide in real time novel opportunities to understand migration patterns, still at different scale. And the last one, and all of them will be illustrated later on, uh, is a new, uh, quite interesting uh, dimension coming up from social media and social network, where people are acting in the cyberspace, are moving in interaction with the cyberspace, and then providing a new data form that can be useful to understand this mobility uh, patterns. Coming back to the early days, uh, it was in the in the sixties and. Just after the second was something quite amazing, uh, a pair for the uh, geographic science. In fact, there is an example which is often mentioned. Just after the, the Second World War, uh, the geography department in Harvard was almost closing. And for what, for what reason, in fact, uh, let's say people were thinking, well, uh, geography is dead, is a sort of static science where people are producing maps and the question is, is it still a, a research area that is worth being continued uh, at the, uh, let's say, high research level? And then came uh, Torsten uh, Agerstrand, uh, and this was the start of the so-called quantitative uh, geography revolution, where the idea was not only to produce maps, but to consider the geographical space as a sort of uh, a background repository space 
that uh, provide a sort of modeling dimension to represent people uh, acting uh, in relation with different places and we still and the pluridisciplinary component uh, just appear uh, as the center and a new way of developing socioeconomical uh, uh, study. And in fact, the geographical uh, domain was not very much anymore centered to producing maps, but rather a way of placing the people at the center of the, the problem, the research problem, in order to understand social and, and group uh, practices. The second thing which is quite interesting, especially for us computer scientists, is that the, the modeling framework suggested by Agerstrang was quite simple with a, a series of modeling abstraction that, when, that then uh, generated a series of efforts to integrate those different modeling concepts uh, at the data representation space. The time geography is made, as you can see, to uh, the left at the, the top, a two-dimensional space plus time as the third dimension and where trajectories are represented in space and time, three dimension, where a different constraint can be applied to, uh, for example, modeling the possible place from a given location where people can go and, and, and so on. And the next uh, modeling abstraction that was quite useful is that Agerstrand was already uh, representing not only trajectories, but also trajectory in relation with different activities people were performing in space and time. And then this gives a sort of idea of uh, the different uh, modeling and interaction capabilities such a framework uh, does provide. For example, we can see at the top uh, left, for a given time, we can uh, locate the location of a given trajectory. These are basic, uh, of course, interaction. We can find for uh, a given time the different locations of different trajectories. We can find uh, the different path that crosses a given location. And from different trajectories, we can analyze the different possible interaction uh, in between the, the people. This is quite simple, but this was quite successful. And uh, from this kind of modeling framework, then uh, the geographical information combination of geographers and computer scientists were then developing this kind of uh, modeling framework where the, what people do, where people are acting, and when people are acting. So this is, let's say, the descriptive uh, dimension. And then trying to make progress uh, in relation with the different trajectories, the events that are related to these movements, the processes associated to these movements, and uh, in order to make progress from the description, experimentation, and explanation to, uh, let's say, move toward, uh, as scientists, can we make some uh, theories to understand the different reasons between uh, and in behind uh, this evolution? So this gives a sort of uh, basic uh, framework and background to uh, the different research and studies I will introduce today. This is a first example uh, I have been uh, conducting uh, in the city of Quebec, uh, where the idea was to, to combine the first dimension I introduced early on transportation surveys and combination with this kind of modeling approach where the idea is to, from the time we can set up a survey, from the time we can have some data, a data based on what we call origin destination uh, surveys. We take a city, we have, oops, excuse me. Yeah, we, we take a city and the idea is to combine a transportation survey uh, studies. We, we have about uh, a series of, uh, from a panel, uh, respondents with different ages and so on. We set up some 
uh, interviews, GPS-based data about the different trajectories, plus simulation software to, uh, let's say, try to uh, simulate the different trajectories from the data they give to us. And also, and I will come back to that in a minute, uh, about what we call their lifetimes. The idea being to, to analyze the trajectories at different scale from, let's say, the urban sale scale on a daily basis to, uh, let's say, what we call uh, the geo lifetime, what people do from the time they work, they evolve, and, and, and so on. Uh, I will not get into the details uh, of the way the, the database communities were organizing the data from this transportation survey, but this uh, is also to make a difference with what we do now uh, with the cyberspace. Uh, in the 80s, 90s, when we have, uh, let's say, a, a sort of uh, database, we organize the data with database modeling approaches. We organize the data uh, using different entities, the lifelines, the time associated to the different trajectory, the places where people are act, acting, and so on and so on. So the data in the 80s, 90s were very well organized. And from the time the data is very well organized, we have a sort of geographical information system with all the data on a daily basis uh, recorded regarding the origin destination patterns. We can have the location of the different places where people are providing the data and the surveys. Coming back to, to one uh, of the first slides I introduced, we can analyze the different patterns at the individual level. For example, here we take a family uh, living here and the different trajectories and the daily trips from a given family using uh, some uh, given criteria. More, interest, more interesting from the local level to the global level, the idea will be to, to analyze some specific pattern for a given category uh, of a population. This is, uh, of course, a single example is when what are doing a woman from 21 to 65 years old at 3 p.m. So you can see different patterns of activity here. Uh, more interesting, and this kind of query is interesting for transportation planning to organizing transportation, depending uh, on some specific uh, family. Here is a single parent family employed full time, uh, where there's people are working at 5 p.m and where there's people are working at different hours. And this provides a sort of uh, representation of the different uh, pattern, uh, social pattern, and we can analyze the data, as you can see, uh, with different statistical techniques. And then we have a sort of understanding of uh, the urban mobility pattern at the daily, weekly scale, and, and so on. The second level, as far as it is a, a sort of big, uh, database. We also have a survey uh, on a long period of time, about 30 years of time, where we do have uh, for a given family the different trajectories. We have, for example, the household trajectory. Are they living single, then in couple, in single again after a specific divorce, the residential trajectory, how people are living in apartment, in houses, and so on, and the career trajectory. And this is quite interesting to see, for example, what will be the impact when there is a, a change of workplace of um, this specific kind of event, moving house. And we can see, for example, that, uh, number one, when there is a lone woman uh, owning a home, uh, this person is not likely to change house. When uh, we have different categories, we can analyze the, the, the different patterns, we can project the different pattern uh, in space. And also, uh, probably more interestingly, we, we can make uh, this kind of analysis, what is the probability of buying a home when there is the first child which is born after three years. And there is another thing which is quite interesting when we combine uh, a different, uh, let's say, population. You can see that uh, in the 60s, People, probably this is the, let's say, the period where people were, uh, let's say, let's say the 60s uh, in Canada and the US, uh, people were not uh, very much, let's say, thinking about 
uh, buying a home while uh, in the 70s, the green and the red and the orange, people were more likely, probably be because of the crisis and so on, uh, having more expectation to, to buy a house when the first uh, child is coming up and, and so on. So this was uh, before the cyberspace. People were developing geographical analysis using transportation surveys, uh, using uh, geographical information capability and so on. And when the, the cyberspace uh, came up uh, with two dimensions, uh, I will uh, explain the cyberspace as a whole and the sensor uh, dimension. To put things in, in context, uh, well, this is probably uh, known by the audience here. When we came back to the 2010, most of the companies were doing things, engineering things. When we have a look to the 2020, most of the companies, the richer one, uh, are not engineering things. They are just taking data from the people and they do have a business model from the, the data they, they keep uh, from the people, uh, meaning Amazon, Alphabet, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Amazon, and so on and so on. And those companies from, from the net are uh, generating millions of data. We do have other companies making a big deal about this data. And us, as scientists, uh, and I will come back to that uh, in the next minutes by presenting some application, we do have some opportunities to maybe, hopefully, to make a good use of the data. So this is the, the thing I will try to, to, to explain in the minute. The, the second thing is uh, humans, uh, before artificial intelligence, we are not alone. We, we are surrounded by uh, sensors. And as you can see here, we do have now more devices, sensors, physical sensors, tracking uh, traffic, traf uh, tracking pollution data, tracking the people. And we have the people. And let's say uh, we do have some telephone companies. We do have Google tracking uh, our data. We do have much more sensors than people. Uh, and the range of magnitude uh, is, uh, of course, increasing. And there is an issue, and there are opportunities. So uh, not uh, quoting Stephen Hawking, but in fact, he, he, say, uh, he said a few interesting things. Uh, before the artificial intelligence, the big data uh, is uh, bringing a sort of revolution. And us, as scientists, uh, the issue is, how can we uh, transform the data as far as we have the data and provide insights by developing uh, new mathematical tools? And this is a challenge. And the challenge is exciting. It is about uh, big data. It is about uh, still uh, collecting uh, the data, finding uh, correlation. And it is also uh, about, uh, let's say, having now uh, related to the different companies I mentioned earlier. Uh, information is the new petrol uh, for us, offering novel opportunities. And this brings a sort of a framework where we do have the people, the environment, the sensors, somehow related to the title of that talk. We have the old days still around where we can develop some uh, database modeling approaches to integrate the data, and then the cyberspace. And all together, Many opportunities, and the one I will dealing with today is about human uh, behaviors, acting, moving, and so on. But not only, we do have a lot of uh, novel areas, uh, mentioning smart cities, intelligent city, digital twins, and so on. Now getting into uh, some application uh, example. Uh, a first one that has been conducted by uh, Shoko Wakamiya, who is connected by the way, and she's currently now at the NARA Institute of Science and Technology. It is a, a, a quite successful example of how we can infer from, let's say, the, the social data world, and basically from Twitter, how can we infer from the way people are acting uh, using Twitter, moving in a given space, can we infer some uh, useful information about the, the way people are moving in a given uh, regional space? 
So the idea is quite simple. Also, uh, research is often, this is something I really believe in. Basic things from basic things, we can derive uh, useful uh, data, information, and, and research. Uh, Twitter. In Japan, the data is available. Uh, it's quite simple data where people are sending tweets from some locations and there's locations and there's people are identified. And the question is, well, can we have a sort of representation of a way, the way a given region is pulsing? And can we have some, uh, let's say, insight about the way and what the people do, uh, by the way, the way the people are uh, moving at the regional space in scale, in space and time. Uh, the idea is not to replace the other ways of developing transportation model and so on, but to have a sort of complementary view in relation to the way we can develop some spatial algorithm, travel time uh, base, such as and so on, but to provide something that will complement the old ways of interacting. Let me show the data. Uh, the data is about, you see the numbers are quite interesting in that region of uh, Japan around Osaka, Nagoya, and Kyoto. There are about 50,000 uh, tweets per weekday, 100,000 tweets uh, in a weekend. And the location of the study is mainly uh, around uh, Osaka, Nagoya, and so on. So we are collecting, and Shoko was collecting uh, crowd footprints of Twitter. She was extracting uh, the different movement. And from the data, the idea was to generate a sort of space, time, representation of the different activities the people were performing. A tweet is quite simple. Every tweet is identified. So there is a data privacy issue here. Time is given, location is given, and something is said. Already what we can see from this kind of picture, probably the next one is better, uh, at any time we have a sort of real-time pulse of a region where people are, what people are sending, and this gives a sort of realistic real-time distribution of the population. The next one is considering, of course, some approximation. When someone is sending a tweet and then sending a tweet from another location, we do have a mobility pattern. And the second interesting thing is that not only we have a sort of representation of the way the, the region is pulsy, pulsing in terms of where are the, the people located, we, we can see the, the different uh, main movements. From the time we have these main movements, we can organize space by setting up some cluster made of a different car clustering algorithm. We, we, we can make some using uh, Voronoi uh, spatialization, some basic entities. We can derive some uh, average time. And then we have a sort of uh, implicit representation of how people are distributed in space. And this gives a sort of uh, spatial structure of the region. Then the connections uh, in between the different places, the different clusters, we average the, the time displacement. And what is getting quite interesting is to uh, have a sort of representation of the main connections and uh, illustrating the, the range of things we, we can do is by comparing, uh, for example, the different interaction in between the, the different places. For example, we can take Osaka and we can have a representation of the most connected places in relation to Osaka, so Osaka is indeed a sort of hub, while image station is much more related to places which are quite far away. So this is the, the sort of analysis we can have, as well as having this kind of uh, representation where we can uh, address some time constraint uh, for the two places, for example, one hour, where are the 
places connected from one hour, both from Kyoto Station and from, so that one is Kyoto and that one, no, is half an hour and one hour, sorry. So we can see the, the, the different connectivity in between the, the different places. We might have a question here is, well, what would be the interest of this kind of study as we do have some transportation uh, algorithm to, to provide this kind of result? The thing is that uh, when there is a specific event, let's say earthquake, whatever, typhoon, et cetera, et cetera, as far as the data is recorded in real time, we can infer this kind of uh, pattern. The other thing is, well, when people are sending tweets, uh, people are saying things where the second idea was experimental was, well, a tweet is about 200 words, uh, mostly. The idea was to, well, can we have a sort of view of uh, the mood of the people when they are traveling? So we made some uh, basic evaluation of the different words, positive, negative sentiments. We made some aggregation. And then the idea is still using the same database. What we discover, of course, what people say when sending tweets is not probably what they feel. But anyway, we find that people were very frustrated when traveling, you see, uh, very negative words. Uh, this is something we can discuss with psychologists but more happy during the weekends. Okay, some basic uh, trend. And we can see the, the location, for example, from, uh, I think uh, the, the red at have, have the good tweets, the blue at the, the bad tweets, we can see that, for example, in, I think in Sakai City, where people are more happy during the weekend than during the weekday and so on. But anyway, okay, um, the second example, I want to, to introduce, um, it was from Mei Yanjin. She's also connected and she's now uh, in Shenzhen. So Mei Yanjin uh, did uh, a quite related project, but not this time from uh, social media, but from uh, human sensors. This is the, the, the Microsoft Research Asia project, which is called uh, GeoLife where over a long period of time for, for several years, the, the data of a panel uh, of population were recording, uh, in fact, all the movements uh, in the city, especially when uh, moving uh, with, with taxi. So the kind of things we can uh, do still at the individual and then uh, at the, uh, let's say, uh, global level is to make a difference for a given person, the different patterns made uh, in the morning or in the evening. You can see the legend here in, in the map. Okay, so we have different patterns. We can have here, for, for example, another case where we can make a difference in between the weekday routes and the weekend routes. We can have for, uh, let's say, two uh, different uh, population, the range of locations covered by this population for a given place. In fact, a university, we can have a sort of distribution of uh, the people connection to that university and, and, and so on and so on. So this was a second example uh, where uh, this time the sensors were providing the data, but still a big difference uh, with what I introduced before. And, and coming back to the application uh, Shoko did in, in Japan, the data was not created for that purpose. You know, the people who are sending tweets, they are sending tweets. And the data is not very much structured, okay? A uh, big difference from the times we were setting up a big database in the 80s, in the 90s and, and so on. The same here, the data, well, we do have a panel, but the people are happy to, to have us using the data. And the main difference is that we, we have a lot of data, unstructured data, non-precise data. You can say to me, well, when someone's sending a tweet and then sending a tweet, this does not represent exactly the time of the displacement. But as we have a lot of data, at the end of the day, the data makes sense. A second application, more recent, that one uh, I, I want to, 
to introduce was developed by and with colleagues in, in Beijing. And, and the main colleague, Peng Peng, is also uh, connected here from, from Beijing. The idea was to, this time at the regional scale, uh, analyze uh, tourism patterns in, in mainland uh, China. And this time using a, a, a social data uh, network, which is in, in China, Ma Feng Yo. Uh, it is a massive uh, web social network where Chinese uh, tourists in China are reporting their uh, tourism activities, their trajectories, and so on. And the idea will be, well, to set up a massive database from Ma Feng Yu to extract the data using natural language processing uh, algorithm and program, and then to analyze the different patterns at the macro, meso, and micro scale uh, using some network uh, analytics. The data is huge, uh, as often in China. We have here a representation of the data uh, volumes generated by this application over a given period of time. We do have the, the market size of the different regions, and already we can see with this kind of mark the sort of distribution of the different tourism activity, and the idea will be to, to analyze uh, the data as computer scientists, what we do is to from the web social site and the reviews to integrate the data to organize the data using a network when there is a trajectory passing through different attractions. We set up uh, a network, we aggregate the network and then the idea will be to analyze the pattern where the dominant attraction have a some uh, structural core periphery a structure that appears and is there any uh, functional uh, motif of a local scale? And, and the question can be, well, why are you doing that? Well, the idea is to understand the pattern and maybe to reorganize, if necessary, in relation with tourism agencies, the, the different activities. Some details here about the, the reviews which are organized, uh, the number of footprints, we are creating a, a database, but more interesting, probably, uh, this gives you a, a single example uh, of a given footprint, one user, a second one, we generate uh, a simple network, a second one, and when we combine, and of course, the different connections uh, in between the different attraction will reflect the number of time someone is passing from A to C and so on and so on. And then the idea will be to, to, to analyze the, the different structures. Is there any dominance uh, effect? Uh, we usually do that uh, in statistics uh, using power law uh, functions. And the idea will be, is there any attraction which is uh, dominating uh, the other one? What uh, clearly appears is that the larger the market of a given uh, region, the, the most uh, dominant um, we, the market uh, is influenced, especially in Beijing, for example, where some uh, given locations do have a very strong uh, attraction uh, power. Uh, this is an illustration of uh, the, the different patterns we, we do have. As you can see to the top, uh, left, Beijing has a very centralized structure, which is also the, the case for Kunming and probably also for Zhangjiang, uh, very much distributed in Baoding and, and so on. We also analyze at the, the local level the, the way uh, the different regions and for given region, the different attractions are cooperating uh, or also some affiliation mechanism. And we can see that the larger the market size, for example, in, in Beijing, there are a lot of affiliation phenomena and cooperation phenomena as well. And competition is not a trend. While uh, this specific case is when an attraction is making a connection in between uh, different clusters of uh, attraction. Uh, another pattern uh, which is quite also uh, emergent uh, and obvious, uh, of course, attraction is depending uh, on the distance, uh, as you can see, 
And also we have uh, still for, for Beijing, a representation uh, of the different uh, attractions of phenomena in between the, the different uh, attractions on the Gideon region and also the direction uh, of the different attraction. Early on, I mentioned artificial intelligence. Uh, one idea we had was, well, fair enough, we can extract some data, we can infer some pattern that can be useful for, for tourism studies and, and, and so on. Uh, another trend uh, from all the data we can have from the social network is, well, from the time we do have some patterns, from the time we can identify some social data for a given user, is there any way of suggesting some tourism uh, activities and trajectory? So this is what we, we, we did by modeling the different dimension, the spatial one, the social one, the different movement. And the idea was to set up a sort of uh, series of mechanism from the data which is recorded with a neural net and some probabilistic, uh, let's say, derivation to find out uh, using a knowledge graph that represent all the information we extract from the social data, the tourism pattern, the spatial behind uh, information. And the idea was to, uh, let's, say, let's say, suggest some visits uh, depending uh, on the social data we do have about a given user, the different patterns we previously uh, recorded and so on. So this is an example where uh, a given user was suggesting this visit by taking uh, into account the, the previous data. We did another study uh, in Hong Kong, still based uh, on the same uh, mechanism. Uh, and this time it was from Trip uh, Advisor. Uh, it was before and uh, during the COVID times. And the idea was to analyze the patterns. Uh, the question uh, being, well, is there any change uh, in the way people are acting, tourists in Hong Kong, uh, before and during uh, the, the COVID? And still by applying a similar mechanism, the idea was to, to extract from trip advisor this time, which is available in, in Hong Kong to extract the, the footprints, to derive some networks, to make connections in between the different attractions that have been part of a given tourist uh, activity for a given period of time and, and so on. And then to infer some, some pattern to see if there is any change and what will be the, the, the pattern uh, that emerged. So still, same approach, deriving, extracting, constructing the network, uh, defining some values when there are some uh, co-occurrences and, and, and so on. And then the patterns emerge. So already we, we saw before the COVID, uh, the number of uh, review were slowing down uh, 2019, but of course really decreasing in 2020 uh, with the COVID. We identified uh, one strong pattern before the COVID, uh, people were one, two, three, four, five, uh, visiting uh, a lot of places. But with the COVID, the number of places were decreasing. And the, the second pattern that was quite interesting is that people were uh, visiting, as you can see here, we, we do have a, a series of attraction well-known which are attracting a lot of people. But during the COVID, the places where people were going were quite different, open space, and much more diffuse. A question that emerged from the people we have been engaged with uh, was, well, what will be the next pattern? Are the, the people maintaining, let's say, a different way of developing tourism activity? Are the tourists just see uh, starting to reflect where there's new trends. So this is an open question. Uh, this is uh, represented here as well, or you can see some strong uh, patterns here uh, related to the places people were uh, as tourists uh, traveling. And we can see here a much more diffuse, much more diffuse uh, set of trends. The last example, uh, 
to conclude, uh, I will introduce is also a, a recent study we, we did in Austria uh, this time, uh, not using social data, but GSM telephone data, where the company was providing the data. So from this time, billions uh, of movement patterns uh, given by uh, the GSM uh, company, we were extracting uh, the different location, mobility pattern in order to analyze the change of patterns before uh, and during the lockdown. The lockdown was not tough uh, in Austria. It was from, let's say, uh, March 20 to early uh, May. Uh, what we can see is that the number of COVID cases were quite uh, huge in the west part of Austria. And we can see that uh, the, the trends in terms of uh, movements aggregated in between the, the different regions uh, were much more impacted in the West region. And as we can see here, when we make a region to region representation of the different movements, the difference that slightly appear here were very much uh, a, a dramatic trend of migration pattern, movement pattern in between the West and the East. And the distances and mobility uh, pattern that appear for all regions, so the colors are probably not well uh, represented here, but in most uh, area, there were dramatic uh, changes uh, in uh, the number uh, and distances covered by uh, the different people. Another one, and this is also related to what uh, I said before, in the city of Vienna, you can see the impact of the movements during the lockdown. But as you can see after, let's say, the, the release, the situation is not coming back to the previous uh, stage. And this is a, a general and interesting question we, we can have at different levels, the COVID. Uh, probably has changed the way people are behaving, the way people are moving, and, and so on. Anyway, let me conclude. What I want to show uh, today is that over the past 50 years, the way uh, pluridisciplinary research uh, is developed when dealing with transportation, migration, uh, socioeconomical studies in relation with some specific categories of activities have been evolved from the time of we were developing big surveys because this is this was the only way of developing structured studies and a sort of accurate representation of some transportation patterns. Then we, we had the, the geographical information evolution with software coming up and a way of producing map, analyzing the data and so on, still with well-organized and well-structured approaches. And then there is this uh, big data, human sensors, social data coming up, where the data is not generated for that. But as far as we have the data, we can play and, and provide some interesting results. I didn't get into too much detail on the way we are extracting the data, providing uh, visualization and so on, but uh, surely there are still many directions to explore in terms of combining geographical, statistical analysis, visual approach, how to structure the data, how to complement the data with conventional uh, approaches and so on. The real-time dimension is a chance because all the data can be organized and analyzed in real time, this being not the case for the conventional studies. Uh, another issue that can be discussed, uh, I mentioned that early on, there's big companies keep the data. Google keep the data, Twitter keep the data, so there is an issue. Uh, there is also a trend which is the emergence of new systems such as Mastodon, which is likely to replace Twitter, uh, for example. We are looking for still some killer application. Uh, the one I introduced early on from Shoko Wakamiya was a killer application uh, at the time of her PhD. Uh, we are maybe also 
looking for products. And always a big question is about ethics. People are not aware of the fact that we are using their data. And this is the case for Amazon, which is using your data to play with the data and to infer uh, new data. This is uh, um, a picture of the, the people that have been uh, involved of, uh, with me with uh, all these studies. Uh, most of the names are here, a few are, are, are missing. Anyway, uh, this is about geographical human uh, people and the environment. And I hope you will have uh, questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for some questions. Uh, anybody? Uh, over there. Oh, I'm sorry, could you please speak into the microphone so that uh, folks on Zoom can hear? Well, thank you for the uh, presentation. Very interesting. I'm very far away from what you do. But one thing I noticed, you, you on one hand, used active communication like Twitter uh, and and as a representation of movement and, and mood versus passive, where like you have like a GPS-like tracking. So by comparing these type of data acquisitions, uh, what do you foresee can you extract in terms of behavior, you know, active, you know, when do I decide to write a tweet is a specific human behavior versus just passively following um, where people go. So, so how, how useful could this be to extract a human behavior? Um, you learn from these differences? Well, this is a good suggestion. In fact, um, for example, if we take was what Shoko Wakamiya was doing in, in Japan with the tweets, uh, we, we might combine the, this kind of social data reference with additional data coming up with conventional GPS, let's say, uh, data. And then trying to, to, to explain the reasons what you were suggesting for someone making one specific trip at a given time. Also, when we are analyzing the, the, the tweet messages to, to understand why people are saying such things at a given time and so on and so on. Yes. Um, there is a range of novel opportunities. When I was in Switzerland before coming here, I was discussing with people from the transportation simulation community and they were saying to me, well, with the data you have, we can probably refine the models we are developing. So combining this kind of heteroclite social data, but to, uh, let's say, to refine the transportation models we are developing and best transportation models being based of, on predictive algorithms and also some, let's say, uh, well-known models they do have. One can help the other. And probably uh, in terms of the novel opportunities we do have, combining different techniques is surely uh, something we, we should explore, yes, right. Yes, Nick? May I ask a, a slightly different version of Christian's question, actually? So in statistical physics, you have these ideas of ensembles, and if things are, are godic, then averages in time and averages in space can kind of give you the same answer. So I was, I was really wondering where you have these very different ways of measuring things. And very large data sets and you ultimately do a statistical analysis where you see the same patterns emerging with from, for example with the data that's correlated in time with tweets and the data that isn't correlated in time with tweets or whether you see qualitatively different things is it a comment or a question it's a question <laughs> it's it's actually a, a, a very similar to the to the last question but but maybe framed in a different way Yeah, I'm thinking of your, your, your question. Um, refining uh, models we, we do have, 
by combining uh, different dimensions here, yes, it could be a way. For example, I am trying to think about uh, an example. If we take what we have If we take what we have in, in this kind of uh, representation here, if I well understand your, your, your question, one direction will be from the data we extract here and from the, the patterns we do have from, let's say, transportation data and from the different models, which are, let's say, uh, usually apply, uh, one with the other can be enriched. But I'm not sure I answer your question. Yeah, maybe I can try to phrase, rephrase it. So if, you, if you're measuring really the same thing in different ways, so, so when you do tweets, you're effectively doing a kind of important sampling, right? So, so you're, you're correlating your measurement with particular events. And I'm just curious when you have these large scale averages of distributions of population, flows of people, et cetera, well, they really look very different when you do that kind of sampling from if you, if you have a, a more neutral sensor based system, let's say, which, which isn't waiting for you to do some social media action before checking where you are. Well, in fact, the, okay. In fact, the, the results uh, derived by this kind of analysis, uh, despite the fact that there are some approximation. Generally fits well uh, the current knowledge we, we do have. Now the point is uh, we, we had this kind of question, what will be the interest of developing this as far as the output is quite similar to the knowledge we do have and from the different models we are applying. The answer is when there is a specific event let's say a, a weather, massive typhoon, earthquake, whatsoever, and so on, with this kind of application, you can have a sort of real-time observation of the impact of the big event on the situation. And this, by the way, was developed uh, by the CIA in Ukraine during the, the revolution, because by observing the way people were sending tweets, what they were send, saying, and the way they were displacement in the city, they, in real time, identify that something was going on. So in fact, despite the fact that this kind of uh, approach is based on non-structured data with many approximation and so on, the first advantage is that it's free, as far as we have the data, it is not costly, and secondly, in specific case, this provides a sort of real-time representation of what is going on. Thanks. Approximation, but useful. Yeah, question up here. Yeah, so thank you very much for the talk. Um, I just uh, can't avoid sort of connecting things with, with an event that is happening at OIS is called Sustainable Transport Hackathon. I'm curious to know like if there is any part of your work that is kind of can give a contribution to this kind of initiative, if you heard about this initiative, because they're also discussing about uh, analyzing data from Okinawa, uh, transportation data. And um, yeah, I'm curious to know like how your insight and your methodology could be beneficial for this kind of initiative? Well, to be honest, before coming here, I saw the different initiatives uh, which are going on here with the Okinawa community. And I, I saw the, the, the GIS group of the data group here, which is collecting data from the different research groups. or so. And then I was thinking, and one of the objective of the, the talk today is, is making connection, of course, uh, first of all. And early June, I will make this kind of uh, seminar for students, but not only. And the second one will be uh, quite related, but with uh, sensors deployed in the maritime environment where we are collecting uh, maritime trajectories, analyzing the data and so on. So of course I'm here to, to interact. So if there is a hackathon, we have been 
uh, doing hackathon in France for, for, for maritime data trajectories and analyzing maritime patterns and so on. So we can, of course, I'm still here for a few weeks. So this is the objective of being here is to, to make connections. It's not easy because the subject, they mentioned that before, uh, one idea was to talk about diversity, but I, I, I choose that one that does not fit completely what people do here. Uh, but anyway, the answer is yes. Thank you very much. Uh, given that you have uh, data about both people and places, so you can like, do a like, bipartite graph analysis and like see like clusters of the like, different groups of people or different clusters of like interesting points for those people, kind of something like this. Yeah, thank you. Well, this is a good comment too. Uh, the, the point is somehow related to data privacy. Uh, for example, regarding the, the, well, there are two issues. One is data privacy, and the other one is the, the big GAFA companies are not very happy to give the data. So there are two issues. Uh, now related to social, social data somehow is a bit more different, uh, especially from what we we did uh, surprisingly in China with Ma Feng Wu because we, we do have the, the, the social background of the Chinese people which are acting as tourists, some social basic data, age, activity, and so on. And this is the way we were proposing and suggesting things. But surely uh, adding, well, for example, in this specific case, we, we know nothing about the people. It will be much more interesting to have additional data and combining this kind of data with, let's say, we probably know that, uh, I don't know, in this specific region of Osaka, uh, the social trend is that one, that one. And then we can uh, make some progress in not only analyzing the way people are behaving, uh, but combining with social data and so on and so on. So there is an open avenue, and the question is how to combine unstructured data with additional semantic data, which is not given at the time. And the domain is just booming, you know, uh, all this Twitter and Facebook, and Facebook is almost impossible to have the data. Uh, Twitter in some countries, and of course, in some countries, uh, the data is not available at all. And you can guess which country, and so on, and so on. Question? Yes. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so this is related to your answer now. I'm just wondering, you collected data uh, from several countries, a different type of sensory data. I was wondering if all of that um, databases are all of them have different structures or have you try to combine into one knowledge graph that somehow you know gives a different puts all the different data different types of nodes that connects together the data well this is a, a good point too uh, thank you um, in fact most of the data we derive and structure uh, at the end of the day it generates a sort of network connection between places, people acting, trajectories, uh, specially and temporally referenced, and, and, and so on. We, today I introduce, for example, the application we made in Japan, the other ones in China. What can we do? Well, in Austria as well, cross-cultural comparison of patterns can be an idea, for example. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, one idea will be if we analyze, let's say, the way people behave before and after the COVID, and I will take the example of the city of Vienna. Here there is a pattern, for example, and we can see that. Uh, after the, after the COVID, after the lockdown, people were not 
behaving as they were before. And the application I introduced in Hong Kong, the objective was different. Uh, we do not have the data uh, after the, after somehow after the COVID, but it will be interesting to see, for example, how people react now uh, and the way they behave. And the fact that the data is structurally quite simple, we are generating networks, uh, probably provide ways of comparing the data, but next the question will be, does it make sense and for what kind of studies, uh, cross-cultural comparison uh, of post-COVID activities, but yes, we can do that. In fact, most of the things we, we did are quite simple. We take the data, we extract the data, we, we do have a network, and then we, we apply some uh, basic query mechanisms. Also, we, we, we do have papers, uh, of course, in background. Nothing is really extremely complicated. And this is the good, good news, I think. People can understand what we do, at least. Thank you. Uh, great. We have time for one more question. I think there was a hand up back here, maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, for the presentation. Yes. Very interesting. Very. Thank you for the French accent. Very easy to understand for for many people. And my, my first question would be about uh, the metaverse and virtual environments and where people are physically in their own apartment, but they can walk around in virtual places from all over the world. So I was thinking, um, do you foresee some? potential good, uh, interesting questions or, or uh, research paths to, to address specifically in metaverse and future virtual and virtually shared environments. And my second question relate to ethics. So what was your, your biggest uh, risk or challenge that you had to face during your research related to ethics? And what we should all fear for the next years as the main big risks that we should face maybe in the next years regarding these questions? Okay. A triple question, sorry. Well, the first one is interesting, the second one as well. Uh, with a few colleagues, we made a sort of review paper uh, supporting that framework uh, and the emergence of uh, cyberspace. In, in geography, there is the so-called first law of geography uh, close, closest things are more related than distant things. But it's not any more valid in the cyberspace. Uh, we can work from here with people in, let's say, in Europe and so on and so on. So nowadays in the cyberspace, and if we talk about uh, avatars, replica in, in the cyberspace, there is a new dimension. And we were discussing, well, I'm promoting now marketing this paper we were discussing this issue uh, in terms of how people are related through the cyberspace, from the activities they perform in the cyberspace and so on. So there is a new dimension here. People are not related by distance, but by topology in the cyberspace, the way they are connected. So this open uh, new modeling concepts to, to derive now related privacy uh, is, a, is a big, and ethics is a big question, uh, especially as the data as human beings. Uh, you know, uh, I show you some example. Uh, some people are worried about that. Uh, some people are worried about that. Uh, and I will show you the issue. Okay. There's, well, Tim Berners-Lee made this statement. He is considered as a father, the father of the, of the web. Okay. Uh, a few a few months ago was organized this web conference uh, in Portugal. Seventy thousand people. I don't know how they did it uh, in Portugal. Seventy thousand participant, probably some of them uh, remotely. They, they have the data. As a human being using Google, and you are using Google uh, as human being, when I was in, in Switzerland, 
Uh, this is the, the place I came from, Brest. Uh, this is Rennes, where you are coming from, Anatole. And Google is tracking all the things I was doing during my stay in, in, in Switzerland, the, the places uh, where I have been. So Google knew that uh, in a specific day I was going to a pharmacy because I have something uh, to deal with. Uh, Google knows that I have been making some tourism. I have the same pictures from my stay here in Okinawa, quite similar. So Google knows that. Uh, Google knows, he knows about you all as well. As far as you are connected to Wi-Fi, uh, he knows what uh, you're doing. He was aware of the fact that I have been uh, in Geneva. More uh, crazy, uh, he knows because not only the data is specially referenced, but also timely reference. Google knows that I have been to Geneva and spending half an hour, 45 minutes here. So Google knows that I have been having uh, a lunch in this place. So this is the way there's big data company uh, are keeping the things we do, the places where we have been without us knowing that you can say to Google, I don't want you to send the data back to me. Or you say to them, this is what I did. I want you to send back the data to me. For example, in Okinawa, I have all my trajectory, the places where I have been with beautiful photographs and so on and so on. So there is an ethics issue. And Google does that for you as well. It's a big issue. And it's a big question. Yeah, definitely. And I know that um, some other companies that used to provide that information for free, uh, namely Twitter, have now exorbitantly increased the fees for API access, for instance. So, huh. you know, now your average Joe can't even access that information anymore, I, I think, in any country. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, your talk. Oh, we have one more question. I'm so sorry. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I actually have two questions, hopefully quick. Um, one of the questions was, you had a slide at the at the beginning about, you know, three levels of analysis. You've got the, district, the descriptive, um, okay. uh, I can't remember, yeah, the, the yeah, impression, yeah. the how and, and, and the why. Yeah. And I was wondering to what extent does this approach um, allow you to actually access the third level explanation, having inferential, because all of it is, you know, hypothesis free to, to, to start off with. I mean, that's the whole basis of big data. Um, so to what level do you feel that you can get to a point of where you're starting to make inferences from this data? That's the, my first question. My second question is kind of related, actually, is um, do you feel that, I mean, where do you see that this, um, the applications of, you know, this kind of approach have been really powerful um, in terms of, you know, either social applications or something that's more translational, let's say, in terms of uh, um, effects on, 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 you know, human beings? Well, in fact, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a good one. Probably in the old days, uh, we were very much efficient in the way we can make progress from the, the descriptive to the understanding dimension, especially, especially what we did in Canada, we were quite, let's say, doing well in the way we were in the position of deriving some interesting patterns because the data was uh, very well defined, extensive and so on and so on. Now the question is, and you are right, with this new big data era where we have structured data, non-semantically significant, we are probably still stuck here. You see what I mean? It's difficult to move, and this is probably related to, to Nick's suggestion. We should find a way of, from unstructured data and, and basic trends, useful but still basing, to making, let's say, uh, a path in between descriptive data to explanation and 
real studies and that making a path toward pluridisciplinary research. So there, there is probably a long way. Uh, from big data from the cyberspace, we can derive uh, single things. Also, in the old days, with very well structured, costly data, we were in the position of developing much more interesting things. The geographers I have been working with at that time will be probably, let's say, uh, not completely convinced with what I was presenting from the cyberspace. You see what I mean? <laughs> but thanks for your question is a key one. Great, thank you. So um, Christoph will be here uh, through the end of June, I yeah, believe. In, so uh, in lab five. If you heard anything interesting, uh, he's eager to chat and collaborate. Yeah. And um, you'll also be teaching a short a series of short courses uh, in, yeah. in the coming few weeks, I, I believe as well. Yeah. So sign up for those. I, I think I'll be attending those. Uh, should be fun. Uh, let's give him another hand. Thank you. Yeah, that last point.